Well, hello there. Live from Kingbridge Conference Center and Institute in King City, Ontario, I'm Susan Radojevic, and this is Corner Office. Our complexity series continues with how to build more effective customer relationships. Preparing for this show, we discovered customer relationships is a very big umbrella that involves connecting with customers, meeting customer expectations, and engaging customers to co-create an experience that will encourage customer loyalty for the organization and brand. Way too much to cover in a 30-minute show. So we're creating two episodes. This month's episode will center on customer loyalty. The good, the bad, and the opportunities in a world that's complex and ever-changing. Joining me are three people who will elevate the conversation. First, our corner office explorers, Deborah Pickfield, principal of ThinkSpot, and Jean Tourneau, CEO of SBBCG Inc. And our special guest is Brenda Higuchi, Vice President Strategy and Analytics of AMIA Inc. Nice to have you in Corner Office. Thank Hi, you. Thank it's you. nice to be here. Before we get started, a few rules of engagement. After all, Corner Office is a hybrid intersection where conversations take place before, during, and after the show. And today, we are streaming live from Kingbridge Conference Centre and Institute in King City, Ontario. If you are watching us online and have a question, please use the chat tab found on your screen. If you are following us on our Twitter hashtag, COLive, post your question using the hashtag. Maria, our community manager, is monitoring our channels and will make sure we get your questions. Okay, with our engagement channels open, let's say we get started. Great. Okay. Two things happened to me this week. It must have been karma. <laughs> Relative to our conversation today. It involved two different organizations. Avis Canada, the car rental people, and CIBC Visa. I'm going to um, use the CIBC experience to discuss uh, this part of this uh, conversation today. Our corporate credit card is the CIBC Visa. And yesterday we received our statement. It showed an increase in interest rates. And I was curious as to why that was, because we are loyal customers. We've been with the CIBC for a very long time. Our corporate accounts are there. Uh, we hardly ever carry a balance, and we pay on time. So I shared this with the CIBC customer care manager, who I called and explain this to him. His response to me was, my lo to the li loyalty comment that I had, today um, loyalty is not relevant and you are a regular customer to the CIBC. I have to tell you, it's very rare that I'm speechless, but for about three seconds, I didn't know what to, how to respond and I actually said to him, I'm not sure how to respond to you right now. <laughs> so the question is, to get our conversation started here, in a world of social media and complexity, what role does the customer experience play when creating customer loyalty? Because according to the CIBC manager I spoke with, it's not important. Customer loyalty isn't important. So who wants to start? Uh, well, I'm happy to yes? open up. Okay. Uh, I do think um, customer service in today's world is a <clears> bit of a challenge uh, for these organizations. Um, what you have is a proliferation of channels, right? So um, an organization such as CIBC manages the contact center, the branches, uh, their website and that sort of thing, but you have uh, a number of different channels that customers are experiencing before they ever actually interact with the brand and that experience continues after that interaction. So uh, I guess what organizations are experiencing is they're really kind of in a way losing control of that customer experience. Uh, in which case they have to ensure that at every touch point they're having with that customer, 
that they're optimizing that experience as best that they can. Um, well, so. I did tweet about it, and as of this show, I had, have not received a response from from uh, a CIBC. So your comment is is dead on there. Yeah, and that, and that's absolutely important um, in terms of how that organization is listening to that dialogue, that chatter that's going on about their brand, and how are they managing that, engaging in that dialogue as opposed to uh, being afraid to interact um, with folks that are talking about them yeah. and that experience, and how are they learning from that? But I, I mean, if I think about it, I'm going, all right. People say everything on social media. I mean, it's just like they feel like they've got this license to say whatever they want. So they're going to say it anyways. Um, but if, if, you, if what you've just said is true, and I agree with you, would you be thinking you want to have everybody as your customer or just to have it more, more uh, the ones who are going to be considered to be valuable are the ones that actually have more products and services with you instead of, as we talked earlier, that was just the only thing you have with CIBC. No, we, oh, we have our corporate accounts. With your corporate accounts. Yes. But still, they're looking for... Personal investments. For, they want investments, right? Because that's where they make money as mm -hmm. well. So do they, is it reasonable to expect that is they're trying to narrow and get... Um, they're going to do a lot more for clients that have more with them. Mm -hmm. And so, in other words, not really caring about the broad base of people because they can't serve all those people anyways because... And the odds are you're going to say something negative anyways about them. So if you don't like something that's going on, because that's one thing I've learned in social media, they'll say anything. Well, I'm not sure about that. I think, I think uh, social media, there's some relevant, very to-the-point comments, yeah. Because when the Avis incident that I had, I did tweet about them as well, but, and they responded. Did they? They actually responded. The CIBC incident about custom, building customer loyalty is really what threw me is that the, to them, this, this manager actually said, customer loyalty is irrelevant. Yeah, I think uh, it might have, have, you might have been going out of his script because uh, I, <laughs> I could not expect... Customer uh, care? <laughs> I could not expect that he took that in his script. I don't know any banks or mm -hmm. any organization that would we'll respect it. itself that would say that. Yeah. And your uh, point about not having all your life, all your... Uh, you know, your business with, the, with them might be an opportunity to say, dear Susan, thank mm -hmm. you very much. Our rates are going up. But because you're a good customer, you have been with us for the last 15 years, <coughs> we're not going to change your rate, which would have brought yeah. to the idea, wow, they really care about me. Yeah. And maybe I can do more business with them. But now with this kind of reaction to say, you know, we don't care about your loyalty. relationship and uh, your loyalty means that if I would be uh, Susan, I would go and look where I could go elsewhere. Because yeah. it really means, you know, that uh, if someone says something like that, it's like, where does it come from? I, I, you know, it's totally uh, mind-boggling. Yeah, but the experience that I had, um, it was mine. It still is. I'm absolutely still flabbergasted with this. But it, it seems to me that the experience that somebody has with a brand, um, with a uh, product or with an organization is based on the customer service that they get. The fact that this person didn't even offer any other mm -hmm. options made my experience that more yeah. worse. So, yeah, the challenge I think with the frontline staff is they need to be A, empowered to be able to manage those relationships and B, they need to know information about you. So you, you touched, Deborah, on the, on the concept of the value of the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a business as complex as banking, that's hard to determine the value mm -hmm. that customer represents. So there's the business that you have with them and they tend to have what we call a polycentric relationship with the customer. You're talking to the, the credit card guys or you're talking to the mortgage guys. So how do you get that integrated view, first of all, the relationship the customer has with you as an organization, but then what is the potential value of that customer? They may have business with your competitors right. that you don't have visibility to, and uh, as you mentioned, Susan, you also have influence to consider, and, and the, um, the referral and the reach that that customer has. So even if they are a regular customer, they may have a lot of influence yeah. that you want to um, make yeah. sure that you're recognized. Yeah. I did yeah. thank him because I said you just I'm just rewriting my script for today's show. <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, you know, in, <clears throat> in Quebec, a few months ago, something like that happened uh, to uh, someone that is uh, a comic, and uh, he uh, just had a coupon of $100 through a cell phone company, and he was just for, not for the money, but just to walk through the system, try to see if he could get, you know, access to his $100, and he went through a few calls, and he put... Uh, he decided to turn on YouTube to uh, because you know he was a public speaker, so he said, "Why not put that on YouTube?" And uh, it took a week, and uh, his uh, his pitch came out to a million people. So wow. I think he damaged more the brand than just uh, one hundred dollars mm -hmm. because he is very well known, and everybody has been watching it, and it went like you know viral all yeah. everywhere. That's right, and that happens a lot. Uh, yeah. You see <coughs> incidents go viral, and. I think the key is customer mistake, customer service mistakes will happen. How you're responding yes. to that is important. And how are you learning from it and ultimately engaging that frontline staff in, in providing a better service at the end of the day? And I think, so to, and to tie that in, what Jean was saying is if every time a client should say something, you should be saying, well, how can we work together? So it, could you keep your balance, of, your corporate balance at, at $5 so that we know we can not you know, I will give you a better interest rate, but something, there's always got to be an opportunity for the client to be able to say, oh, okay, well, I can do that, and so then maybe that'll re reduce my interest rate or something like that, but they didn't take that opportunity with you at all. They just no. said, no, you're just not valued yeah, to us. Yeah, deal with it. The yeah. Amos lady told me the same thing. You know, it was interesting, though, because they asked, uh, when I tweeted about the issue with Avis, they asked me to send them an email. Uh, actually, they asked me to send them a direct message, and I said, well, I'm not following you, so send me an email. So I emailed them. I got an auto-reply. I emailed it, and I got an auto-reply to them. And I thought to myself, why wouldn't you have given me an, an actual person's email? If you took the time to ask me from, to, to send you what's happened, why didn't you give me an actual person's email instead of the general customer care email address? Mm -hmm. I just don't think that, cus that organizations are connecting the dots that experience um, that customers are having. having. Um, I find that sometimes the, there's a difference between what the, what the organization thinks the customer needs and what the customer is asking for or wants. Those are two different things. And I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it, you, now you're talking about that. I had the same experience a week ago when I went to uh, to a bank to deposit some money for uh, my son who is on uh, travel, uh, you know, in South America. And uh, my daughter, five minutes ago, just went to open a bank account with uh, TD Bank, just to name them, because they did an amazing job. And my daughter came back home, and she's 20, and she said, wow, you know, it was so easy compared to the other bank, which I'm not going to name because it would not be nice. But in any case, I'm going to my other bank to deposit checks and then I go at the counter and the, the young uh, lady welcome me, I say hi, or are you, I'm here to deposit some checks, it's my son for deposit only with the bank account number and she said I need piece of ID. I said okay, I've been doing bank with banking with you for 48 years. Wow. So if you don't know me and I've been banking with you know this bank for 48 years and if you don't know me you know it's like you know, what does it take you, yeah, know, you, you should have a picture of me somewhere yeah, that you shows who I am and it's like money in the bank account going in this bank account of this gentleman and I'm not she said I need to know uh, who does the deposit so I said it's so complex and every time you we do something with you and she said it's not me it's what I'm being told I said I, I'm not blaming you. Can you tell to your manager about this? Because everything we do, there's a, what we call a hassle. Yeah. You know, everything yeah. that you do is like turn off, turn off, turn off, every time. Yeah. What you, you hit on it interesting when you said they should know me. That is a key customer expectation today. You know as a customer that your bank knows or should know a lot about you or any organization that you're interacting with. So that now you set an expectation, particularly in a loyalty program, we're asking for additional information to now that you know me, make it relevant to me and make that experience more personalized, more customized, make it easier for me to interact with you. Those should be all the benefits that an organization can deliver to a customer from a loyalty perspective if they know you and if they can truly react that way. But how do they get to know you? If 
if I mean, in, in my case, just to give you an example, answering your question, I have a chip on my card, you know, my, uh, my deposit card. So not that I did not have any piece of idea, I had my bank card, you know, that I deal with that bank with my chip. So technically, you should know when I just walk in, she should say, hi, Mr. Letourneau, how are you? You know? <laughs> So it's like, why doesn't, why, you know, I gave her my card and then she said, you have two other pieces of ID with pictures. I said, look, <laughs> I don't know, I thought I was coming home, you know, somewhere where I've been doing business since I was uh, three years old. So you should know by now who I am, mm -hmm. you know, and you have all the tools. And, I, and uh, for me, it was mind boggling. You know, yeah. you should take the time to know what bugs yeah. you. Yeah, well, and these are all key decision points. Every time someone, a customer is interacting with you, they're having an experience. And that experience could be positive, it could be negative, it could be neutral. Um, but key from a loyalty perspective is how are you either leveraging those positive moments to create increased loyalty for a customer, or if the moment is neutral or, or maybe less desirable, that's where loyalty can step in and turn that experience around mm -hmm. for you. It's critical to know what those key moments are in which that um, the customers are interacting with you that may change their behavior for the future. And, and whether they choose to stay, whether they choose to um, uh, spend less with you, um, or they're uh, so happy with you they'll advocate on behalf of your brand. Um, that's where loyalty, I think, ties in well to making sure that it hits on those key moments and that it's um, turning even less desirable experiences into something positive. Let me ask you something, Bryn. How How are Canadian organizations adapting to this what we're just talking about here, because one obviously is not doing a great job, in my opinion, um, to connect with the loyalty, with, to give customers more loyalty, to be more loyal. With yeah. Them. What I'll, are they do? How are they? How are we doing with that? Uh, it it needs work. You know. <laughs> <laughs> You're being kind. I'm being kind. <laughs> no loyalty, definitely in this market, needs to evolve. It's not. Um, we were talking about a little bit about the evolution of the customer themselves, the way they are interacting with brands today, you know, the, uh, it's all being driven by social media and by the adoption of smartphones. We have over 10 million Canadians today that have smartphones in their hands and that's the way they're choosing to interact with us. Um, social media adoption is, is huge and an uh, interesting stat that I saw from um, a study done by Time Warner is that um, people in their 20s, they call them digital natives, uh, are changing, switching media 27 times in a non-working hour. Oh you know, how do you keep up with that uh, from a customer experience point of view? So today, in, in most cases in this market, loyalty is still very much focused on that actual transaction. I come in and make a purchase mm -hmm. or I use my card or there's some kind of actual direct interaction with the brand. Loyalty tends to be tied to that and you only experience it in the channels that are owned by that organization. Whereas customers, as I mentioned, are interacting in all these channels and, and devices um, prior to ever interacting with the organization, and then they're in those same channels outside of that interaction. What we're looking at as an organization is how do you extend that loyalty experience across the entire life cycle, not just focused on the purchase? And, um, and then how do you engage in those other channels that I, that I don't own as an organization? How do I create that loyalty experience for customers? even when they're not interacting with mm. me directly. I think loyalty was there to move people in the past, to motivate people to go and uh, buy from you. Now, you know, loyalty is an accessory, loyalty or loyalty programs. Customer experience is becoming the brand, meaning if you don't give a pro or provide a great customer experience, you are going to suffer and no matter any kind of loyalty that you're trying to build, you have to go first to build a relationship with the client and you have to provide you know, a, a good experience at, across all the channels, but more so when you interact either through a call center, because now you have someone human, or through uh, brick and mortars when you go physically. And you know, your expectation, and even if I consider myself pretty good on technology, you know, your expectation is not the same when you push on your I Apple to get the same experience. But when you go at the branch, because instead of now going every week, you go once every six months, nine months, you know, you expect that you're going to get the great service. Yeah. You know, yeah. before everyone was going there like three times a week to go and exchange their $20 check. Now it's like people go there once for 
you know, every six months, but they go for something. Wow. So you expect them to have this experience because it does not happen as much as it used to be. So from a customer, my touch points are a lot less direct, but if there's a variation, it hurts a lot more because mm. you, you as a company don't have as many chance to recover. Well, and I, I think part of the challenge is too that that experience on like both on a mobile device or online and the in-store bricks and mortar are happening more and more simultaneously. The retailers are really suffering from this, that I'm in the store shopping. It's a uh, phenomenon called showrooming, but I'm actually price checking on my mobile device as I'm shopping. And often they're losing sales right at the point of purchase um, because they can't compete on price. I can check it on Amazon as quickly as I can go to the point of sale there and order it and mm -hmm. get it get what I need. So uh, that experience is so dynamic now. Um, it's, it's no wonder it's difficult for organizations to keep up. Wow, you can tell why we are taking this um, discussion to two shows because we are going to take a quick break right now and when we return, we are going to start our experiments. Uh, Deborah, Jean and Brenda are going to share with us how we can create more uh, effective uh, loyalty programs to engage customers. Don't go away. The future of meetings and events as a business builder and leadership intervention tool is not about going just to talk, it's actually going to do something. Dealing with corner office, one thing that where I thought was found huge value in this was the preparatory work. Getting people to, uh, to trust and uh, well, I call it going deeper with them. Because if, unless you can get them to go deep, you don't get out what they're really thinking and you don't get out the really good ideas and you don't get out the, the, the whole purpose for, for having the collaboration. Having the, the live people here and the online and, and having the both, both brought in, I really like that as opposed to just having online or just having live. And uh, they actually walked us through a whole process and asked us some tough questions. If you're going to be put in front of a camera, and they ask you, you know, why do you exist? I th thought that was just a stroke of brilliance. An, an idea for them to take away, like some of this, take some of this brilliant conversation, and this is how you might consider beginning to apply it slowly mm -hmm. into what you do in your do daily life in one small thing to get them to start shifting. This arrangement was very conducive. continuing our complexity series and this month's episode is on co-creating customer loyalty and Maria is telling me that we have a question okay so the question is um, there's quite a bit of cross-pollination of data and procedures in order for a loyalty program to be effective and um, what role does an organization's culture play in that we, we touched on briefly the idea of engaging your employees and I think it's absolutely critical as part of your loyalty strategy that you have a strategy for also how you're creating that loyalty amongst your employee base. That's part of the culture. Um, the worst thing you can do is go out with a brand promise that says, you know, we're the friendly bank and then have employees that are surly. So you need to make sure that your employees are living the brand, that you stand for certain values as an organization and that you're engaging your employees in those values and building that culture of empowerment I think is also a key aspect. Anybody want to add to that? I'm just thinking about the openness that you were talking about earlier, right? So if, if that openness isn't there, well I think we were talking before the show about the, somebody said, we don't know who the CEO, we don't know how to reach them, it's just not something we share. If that openness isn't the, in the culture, that openness with the clients is going to be awfully difficult and, and so the clients would feel that and kind of go, well, are you really working in my best interest anyways? Mm -hmm. um, so I think if we can, that would be the one thing I'd want to impact in the culture is the openness. 
You know, when you look at uh, loyalty, you cannot uh, create external loyalty if you don't have the internal loyalty to be, you know, in line. Meaning, I was reading a, a, a survey from Gallup that was saying, um, it was uh, <coughs> from our business review a few years ago, was saying that 19% of employees are engaged, 60 some percent are, uh, you know, kind of going to work for getting their paycheck and 19% are completely uh, not interested. They just go to work. So how can you generate you know, a loyal uh, environment with your customer when you only have 19% of your workforce that is engaged? Mm -hmm. So for me, if you spend money to build a loyalty program on the back end as a recovery because you have done a bad job internally, you know, you're just wasting your money. Mm -hmm. Because you have six to nine percent of your own employees who are working a bit like you're experienced to beat the odds of keeping you as a loyal customer because they're not working in line. So you need to balance. You know, you expect to build loyal customers at the external. You have to build internal uh, uh, loyal employees. And if your numbers are not in line, you're just wasting time and money. Yeah. And that's why probably you had that such a great experience with uh, CIBC visa. Uh, <laughs> yes, this week. Well, uh, we hope we answered that question for our virtual audience. So, the experiment part of the show. So, this is where um, you each have two minutes to give us some uh, takeaways, something that we can actually start right away, what, that our audience can start right away to do. And, um, and then we can have a little bit of an exchange around that. So, who wants to go first? <laughs> Ms. Keener? <laughs> Um, and on the loyalty side, I, I don't have as much experience on this side, but what I, is striking me is it's, from our perspective, we're looking at it from a membership, right? How can we, how can we make a membership attracted to us? And so when, I, when, we talk, when you talk about loyalty, that's how I look at it, right? Let's, um, how can we do that? And um, so the one thing I was thinking was, well, I can't personally stand loyalty cards. They drive me insane. So I'm the worst kind of consumer for that. But letting them tell us so whenever we talk to somebody would be finding out what that opportunity is what your experience was let's just find out what the opportunity is for you so unless we ask we can't possibly know right so i would rather every time we're talking to somebody to say what's the opportunity we're thinking what's the opportunity that i can work with you or you about something and that's the, that would be the experience always just trying to figure out how can we work together so ask the frontline people or whoever is a point, point of contact with the customer, what can I do to exactly. make your experience yeah. more uh, enjoyable so that you will become a loyal customer? Yeah, so somebody that... asked me, Deborah, if you hate loyalty cards, because I really do, what, what would, because I can't be bothered with them. I'm just like overwhelmed with stuff, right? Like I just can't stand the clutter. So I would, but if they said to me, what would it take? Just ask me, honestly, and I don't know that people actually do that. They presume I want this stuff, and I but, don't. Yeah, sometimes, you know, uh, my experience is they will ask you, you know, when you go to uh, business depot, uh, business staples or business yeah. depot, they ask you, you know, have you found everything that you yeah. were looking for? And fill in, but and, they and ask call, you, they call that but they don't, the they don't really mean it. I they know. just ask you because it's part of their script. Yeah. Meaning it would be asking you and looking at you in the eyes and try to resonate with you, you know, uh, have you found really everything that you were looking for instead of, you know, trying to rush you out and say, look, if you, you know, have you found everything? Because I have never seen anyone say, no, I haven't found, but I would say nine times out of 10, I haven't found what I'm looking for. Yeah. And I know she's just asking me just to get me out of here. So it's like, I'm not gonna pay attention <laughs> to tell her, you know, what was my, my We're feeling. We're a bunch today. So <laughs> you need to have, re try to resonate with your customer when you have it on the line and you yeah. have at the point of contact and really show not only that you are following the script, but that you care that what's behind the script. Yeah, yeah. E exactly. Mm -hmm. And so just if it, if it is that, those ones where you're going out and they say, can you call in and, or, you know, here's a code number or something like that. And I've never yet once ever done it. I have no interest in doing that. And so why is that? Right. So I'd find out. I mean, obviously they must get enough people doing it, but yeah. ask me why I'm not going to do that. Well, yeah. I have no time for it. Sorry. That's, so your, that's your experiment is the next time somebody, um, the frontline people need to ask why, what, what can they do to, to better the to better. Yeah. So everybody should right. at least make a point of asking to if better If that person experience. had asked you that right. question, yeah. how would you have felt? Much better. 
than it was. Saying, I would have felt like I'm not a, not a regular. I would have felt more than a, just a regular customer. Yeah. 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 Okay. Maria, yes, we're done with our two minutes. <laughs> okay, John, your experiment. I mean, the the experiment is something that you know I believe in making things much simple. Yes. And for me, it's uh, uh, you know uh, not about what they call big data and lots of information that you need to study for years and uh, come up with solutions and buy big software to make a lot of analytics and it's not to respect you because I've done a lot of work with <laughs> analytics but you know uh, a week ago I was at an IBM show and uh, one of the guy it's funny because IBM it was a big data analytics show a year ago but now this year they are called it uh, uh, business performance okay. so they have shift the same the same content but the the envelope has shift from big data to business performance okay because they have realized that by pushing big data, you're building big complexity. Mm -hmm. You know, you need big experts, people with big brains, with big programs, big business model, big mathematical model. So my experiment that I would suggest to people to do is next time you plan to do something either with a customer, either with internal or external customer, meaning I work in finance and I want to do something with the business units, I want to produce new reports, you go out instead of first, the typical attitude is to say, I know what they want and I'm going to build it and I'm going to give it to them. So you, the experiment is you write what you think people want and you put that into your desk and then you go and ask and see, you know, and talk to people, go out of your lab to go in the field and ask people. And then when you come back and you compare notes. And this is where, you know, there's a lot of ways to reduce complexity. Complexity by stop guessing what people are looking for, by mm -hmm. stop to yeah. uh, look in history, in uh, historical information, current information. It's, it's what I call feed forward. Looking for information that people tell you, and that makes it much easier. So your experiment is to ask what people want. It kind of piggybacks what I said earlier about um, not giving people what you think they need, but actually physically asking them what they want and, and, then, yeah. and then giving it to them or figuring I mean, out a way the goal to... is not always to give it to them because you have to go into an arbitrage right. position, meaning you would tell me, Jean, I want a, a, a Porsche, and I would say, sorry, I'm just uh, selling Toyota. <laughs> so that does not work, but at least it helps you to, 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 to increase it, what yeah. I call predictability. Because if I don't give you what you want, I can expect that you could be upset. Yeah. If I give you what you want, I will know that you will be happy. So it is not about doing exactly what the customer will have, be asking for, but it, has, it is about in, improving predictability by knowing what you want and making my choice to give it to you or not. Or so even meeting you halfway, right? I mean, exactly. At least, so, but at least that, you know that what old discussion wanting. and yeah. what I call communication where people start to talk instead of just, uh, uh, you know, uh, Directing. Uh, yeah, being around. Now this is where you add really value. Did you want to add something to that, Brent? No, I think, uh, I think you're right. We need to ask more, in both cases, ask more about your customers and the opportunity that represents. But there is a piece there about capturing that knowledge, because now you, again, have set an expectation. The customer is giving you something mm -hmm. because they're expecting a benefit. So hopefully they receive that benefit, but then next time you come in, you don't want to be asked the same, what can I get you today when mm -hmm. you've already told them? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the hospitality industry is very good at this. You know, you tell them you don't like feather pillows. When you show up at their properties again, there are no feather pillows, yeah. right? So they remember and they can act on it and it creates a great experience. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's what we call doing it in a closed loop. Like right. I listen, I do, and that's then I right. say this, yeah. I've done it. What can I do for you next time? Okay. You know, you want a bigger... <laughs> Bigger car, you want a Ferrari next time, Suzanne, so yeah. it's all yours. <laughs> okay. Right uh, Okay, so my experience uh, experiment is to experience your company as a consumer would, as one of your customers would. Oh, cool. And maybe while you're doing that is think about how you might create loyalty within that experience as you go along. So I would suggest starting with the research phase. So customers, as I said, do a lot of knowledge and research about your brand before they ever actually interact with you. Don't go to your corporate site, but go where else consumers might be learning about you. What other forums are they finding out about you? 
other than what you're putting out there as a corporation. So I'd start with that. Uh, next, when you're getting into Evaluate, customers might be then coming to your corporate site, but they might be doing it on a mobile device. So check out your site, but use the devices and the channels that the customer is using. Go on that mobile site. Is that experience optimized? Is it easy to interact on your site with the devices that customers are using mm -hmm. today? Um, next, Engage. You know, So this is the, the part we focus on, right? I'm, I'm making a purchase or I'm transacting in some way. Um, but do it in a different way. So your, your story about uh, earlier about the email uh, and getting back the automated response, send a complaint to your contact center uh, with an email and see how they respond, how quickly and, and how they react to that. And um, lastly, uh, what you want your customers to do if they're having a great experience is to advocate. Are you making it easy for your customers to do that? Are you integrated into their social graph? And are you allowing them the ability to advocate easily on behalf of you? Um, put something out on Twitter, as we were talking about earlier. See who engages with you. Is it other customers, or is it your own organization that's answering your questions? So I think if you took, put the customer lens and not your corporate lens, and go through the, the process right from end to end, not just the purchase transaction, it, it could be a very eye-opening experience. Wow, great. Yeah. Anybody want to add anything? You know, I was uh, looking and uh, at something very interesting. Uh, one gentleman was talking about uh, banks. Many banks are using mystery shopper that they send in yes. the banks to experiment what would be the service. And that guy would say, you know, what if the mystery shopper would, instead of going through a script that is pre, uh, kind of pre-packaged by someone who wants to obtain the information that they're looking for, why not just asking simple question as a mystery shopper, why should I do business with your bank? So in your case, when you were being turned off by CIBC, you should say, I'm sorry, sir, but why should I do business with your bank? And probably could not have answered. You, know, no, you could have said, yeah. I, our bank doesn't care to do business with you. Yeah. So, <laughs> Well, that, I think that goes back to what Brenda said, that we need to engage people. I, I think that in this particular case, the CIBC frontline person that was actually a manager, not even an agent, was not engaged at the top where loyalty may matter to the higher ups and not the you know it, he didn't he didn't get that memo <laughs> yeah well and it, it's it, it's frankly a common struggle yeah. you know your story happens to be about CIBC but we've all had stories yes. I'm sure we if we go back the last two weeks we each have a story about any organization and it's something they're all struggling with and uh, so there's just a few things that I think we can do a little bit better um, in terms of engendering loyalty I think just taking the time, I think, I think what, we, what we're taking away from here, because we're going to wrap up now, um, is taking the time to engage, to understand, um, to listen, which is something that um, collaboration, uh, Deborah, you talk a lot about, is mm -hmm. to listen about uh, what, the, what is being said, and then trying to respond in a very effective way so that the customer does get some sort of a feeling that they matter, that you know they've selected what I really got from my dis my interaction this morning is that I didn't matter. Mm -hmm. That it, I really didn't matter to this to this person and not to the CIBC organization. So I think that's what we're really taking away mm -hmm. here. Is that but, correct? Yeah, and but but I would see that's a pretty natural evolution as things become more and more automated, and we're just our interactions are less and less, and so it's just it's it's almost like this kind of a dis comfort or a discontent that's happening, we just got to figure out how do we migrate yeah. through it so that when you do have that customer experience every six months in a branch, it's great. But knowing that the rest of the time it's actually economical, they don't talk to you and it's just how do we do everything, everything with a machine, Yeah, right, with a yeah. computer. So. Wow, what a discussion. It's a good thing we're taking this to two shows. So uh, I want to thank Brenda Higuchi and Deborah Pickfield and Jean Luturneau for being in Corner Office today. Corner Office Complexity Series, How to Build More Effective Customer Relationships, Part 1, is locked in. If you would like to watch this episode again, it is being recorded and will be available for viewing next week on our webpage, Corner Office Episodes. Our website is theparagonagency.ca. If you have thoughts on today's show, go to our website and click on the agency blog and post your comments. Find us on Twitter, our hashtag is CEOLive, or follow me at Susan Radojevic. Bookmark our agency blog and see, be the first to hear about our next Complexity Series episode, which will be part two of Customer Relationships. If you 
if your organization has a business method, tool, or technology our community should know about, or if you would like us to broadcast live from your facility, go to our website and click on Contact Us. Thank you, Maria, and a big shout out to our sponsors and partners coming up on your screen. Check them out, folks. And finally, thank you for participating today. For Corner Office, I'm Susan Radojevic, logging out.